Chuck Fresh of the PCGYN. This is Computer Care Clinic's tip of the day. We're beginning to offer some of our older trading programs and put them right here on the internet so everyone can see them. Of course, we still have personalized trading and training in our stores in uh, Sun Tree and hopefully soon in Merritt Island. So today we are going to talk about the iPad. Now, this is a beginner's overview. If you've had an iPad for five years, this is not for you. This is somebody who's just picked up an iPad or got one as a gift recently within the last couple of months and just wants to know what's under the hood, what makes this thing tick, what can I do with it, what can I do with it. And uh, that's what this introduction is all about, so I call it the eye overview. So you've got your iPad. It applies to the minis. There's a whole bunch of different flavors of iPads, which we will cover as long as we go. And um, it's kind of like an iPhone. So if you have an iPhone, it's going to be a real easy transition for you to go to the iPad. It's like a ginormous iPhone, although with the 6 Plus, uh, it's getting pretty close to the size of the mini. So, um, of course, obviously without the phone part. Now, if you have... Um, uh, the uh, FaceTime or Skype applications, you can almost make phone calls on this thing over Wi-Fi or 3G if you have one of those set up. So it's like a giant iPhone. Think of it like a giant iPhone without the phone. It works almost identically like the iPhone in terms of apps and functionality. Um, here's a whole bunch of different flavors. The latest one is the iPad Air 2, which came out, uh, I think, in 2014. Then there's the original iPad Air, and then there's the original iPads, iPads 1, 2, 3, minis, and the smaller iPads. And you can see the prices. You can end up paying all the way up to $829 for one with 128 uh, gigabytes of storage in it, which is not a lot by computer standards, and we'll talk about that, too. That's one of the downsides to the iPad. But there's a lot of good sides, too, too, and we'll talk about those. Now, it's eye stuffed with all kinds of things you can do with this thing. You can read newspapers, books, you can watch movies, listen to music, play games, get your email, and surf the web all on one lightweight, thin, pretty fragile device. So if you do get an iPad, if you do have one, or if you're planning on getting one, make sure you get a, a pretty durable case that'll protect it. Because anything, as we said with laptops, anything that's portable can and will be dropped. It's just a matter of when. So... A um, lot of stuff you can do on these things. It's amazing all the technology they've crammed inside these. Uh, and the screens are real easy to see, too. And there's pinch and zooms, which we'll talk about in a, um, a uh, future video. We'll go into a little bit more depth and start to get in. Uh, kind of uh, we'll ramp up to advanced iPad usage as we go along. Now, um, with that said, there is no written manual for the iPad. And Apple believes in justly so that there's really no need for instruction basically you click on something and it opens up so they have done a, a, a fabulous job of making the ipads really really easy to use and get around now, there's some stuff in the background that you may have some questions about there's some stuff that's not really obvious and uh, we'll talk about a few of those things and again we'll go into more depth in future videos now um, if you're familiar with the Mac operating system or if you have an iPad and you're like, wow, this iPad's really, really easy. I think I'll get a Mac. It'll be just as easy. Eh. Sorry, buddy. The Mac operating system, um, which is, I don't know, they were with cats now. It's OS X, and they're into leopards and then horses, and Lord knows what they're up to now. But uh, it's virtually, although the icons may look the same, the functionality of a Mac computer is nothing like an iPad. It's much more complicated, not nearly as intuitive. And you would think since they invented this terrific device, this iPad, that they'd make the Mac more like it, which is what Microsoft's trying to do with Windows. That's why they came out with Windows 8 and the tile, so they could cross all their platforms, their phones, their tablets, and their computers with the same operating system so you'd have the same experience across all of them. But Mac... Well, they don't have that same philosophy, unfortunately. So uh, if you do decide you want to go to a Mac and you've transitioned from a PC, you're going to have a heck of a time. We take a lot of them in trade because people just can't figure them out um, without uh, formal training anyway. So nothing like the Mac. If you're looking for the Mac uh, experience, then you're going to be disappointed. Or if you're looking for the iPad experience on a Mac, it's uh, not what you're going to uh, end up with and unfortunately mac still curiously enough doesn't offer a touchscreen pc which just blows my mind that they haven't done that yet but whatever i'm not as smart as they are now to set this thing up the first thing you're going to have to do is uh connect it to wi-fi and then you can set up your email accounts and 
Screen brightness, wallpaper, customize it a little bit. There's limited functionality in terms of customization and colors. They really want you to enjoy the Apple experience that they provided for you. There is an airplane mode. If you go on a plane, you can use it in location settings and all that stuff. And you're going to find all of that under the settings icon, which still looks like the little gear thing. So uh, that's where you're going to find all that stuff. But the first thing you need to do is connect it to wireless. You're kind of dead in the water unless you connect this to wireless Internet. And you can do that through a typical home wireless network or a Starbucks or McDonald's Wi-Fi hotspot or a hotel or something or your friend's house. Or um, you can also subscribe and get a 3G data connection through AT&T, Verizon, and the bigger carriers too. Although I must warn you that um, they do charge... Uh, based on the amount of data to use and you start streaming music and videos, you can end up with a really, really big bill. So the best thing to do is to use a wireless home internet connection. And uh, unfortunately, you cannot plug an ethernet cable. So if you just have the box that uh, AT&T, Bright House, Comcast, Verizon, somebody gave to you, you're going to need a wireless router. And fortunately, most of them are standard now. So you're going to have a wireless router built into most of your newer broadband connection so that's usually not a problem but wireless only no place to put you can't even put an adapter in here for an ethernet so uh, they're very unforgiving in terms of connections to these things so the big question is i see people get these things for the first time and they're like well do i touch it or do i tap it or what's the right level since it's a flat glass screen, it can be difficult to figure out how long do you need to touch something? Do you just need to tap it lightly? You're really going to need to get into it, feel it. And it works pretty well, but it just takes a little bit of getting used to. So basically the rule of thumb, the rule of thumb, get it? When you're touching something, the rule of finger is to just quickly touch or tap it. You don't have to tap it really hard, just enough so you know your finger's on that glass and that opens an application. Now, if you hold it too long, things will start to wiggle, or some people call them dance, and then you can move them, delete them, or do whatever you need to do. We'll talk about that in an advanced class. So your finger is now essentially the mouse and the cursor, so you don't need any extraneous third-party stuff. Of course, this is a Samsung picture in there, but uh, the Samsung Android tablets and iPads both work the same exact way in this functionality. So... Uh, now, swiping is a little bit different. It's another thing you're going to do with your fingers. So if you want to move a page left or right, you're going to swipe to open up the next page or move left or right uh, horizontally. So you will need to swipe to open your device, just like an iPhone or just like an Android. You swipe it to open it, and then when you go to page to page to find uh, your additional icons, you'll swipe left and right, usually to the left and uh You'll find the rest of your icons there. You can also use that to swipe. Uh, in games, swiping is uh, sometimes useful. And also, if you're reading books on your iPad or iPhone, you're going to swipe left and right to change the pages. So Now, typing's all done, and this is where it gets a little weird because people try, they assume that they're going to be, oh, I don't need a computer anymore. I'm just going to use my iPad. Well, what they don't realize is the standard issue is an on-screen touch keyboard. It's not tactile. There's no feedback. It's not three-dimensional. So it's really hard to set your fingers up on that home row and type 150 words a minute. It's just some people can do it. Some people are surprisingly quick on these things, but you're going to find that uh, the touchscreen keyboard is quite unforgiving, especially when you get into high-speed typing. And uh, if you want to use it for any type of work, you're going to find that difficult to do. So, but it does pop up whenever you need it automatically. It works very, very well. And as you can see by the hint, if you turn it horizontally or in the landscape or wide position, you've got a little bit more space between the keys. Otherwise, they're kind of jumbled together and close together. And a lot of people, especially with bigger fingers like myself, have a hard time typing on it in portrait mode. So um, you can get an external keyboard. Unfortunately, most of them are very, very small. They try to match the uh, bezel size of the iPad. And doing that, you don't have a whole lot of real estate to work with, so they have to shrink the keys down. So you're going to put tactile keys, but they're going to still be very, very small. There are a couple of keyboards. I can get a Bluetooth full-size keyboard, but that kind of defeats the purpose of having this portability. You might as well use a computer at that point. And uh, they do connect via a wireless Bluetooth connection. Can't really plug anything into these things uh, easily anyway. So Now... Apps. Everybody's talking about apps now because Apple came out, and I guess apps sounds like apples. Apps, get it? Well, I don't know what their reasoning was or the justification, but they used to call them programs, so now everybody's taking to call them apps because they have an app store. 
Is this all starting to make sense? Clever, isn't it? So these apps or programs, so you can find games, notepads, emails, calendars, uh, Pandora, Netflix, Facebook, all kinds of learning things for schools and uh there's bazillions of them out there. I think uh, last count, last time I checked, there was, uh, I think, close to a million apps on the App Store. There's probably more now. And they're priced. A lot of them are free. What they'll do is they'll try to get you in for free. They'll give you a limited version. You can play for so many minutes or so many levels. And I'm like, hey, if you want to play some more, give us 20 bucks, and you can bump up to the paid version. It's usually cheaper than that. But uh, some of the apps, more of the professional apps, some of the uh, music, professional music mixing apps, and some of the educational apps can be well in excess of 100 bucks. So be careful. You can run up your credit card relatively quick on these things. So how do you get apps? Well, you have to go to the App Store. And you do need to sign up for an Apple account if you don't have one to access the App Store. You just use your email address, pick a password, put in some uh, personal information so you can verify your identity. And back in the day, you needed a credit card. I'm not sure if you still need a credit card to sign up for the App Store. Last time I heard, I you didn't. But uh, uh, you shouldn't really need a credit card if you're just downloading free apps. But eventually, you're going to buy something, so you're probably going to have, a, have to have a credit card on file. Also, last time I checked, too, forgive me for not knowing this, is they wouldn't let you use prepaid credit cards. You had to use a traditional credit card. I think you can use debit cards, too. But be careful because uh, if your name or username or password gets hacked, then somebody's going to charge up a whole bunch of crap to your credit card on the App Store, and that's no fun either. Fortunately, they do uh, work with you to remove all those charges, which is pretty cool. So the App Store is... Um, well, it's not as intuitive as I had hoped it would be. Now, you can sort through different types of list things by games, by popular applications, the top 100 apps and all that stuff. But if you see in the upper right-hand corner, there's a search. Or if you're looking for a particular thing like a Chrome browser or a solitaire game, you can at least type something in there and it'll narrow down your searches. Um, there's also a bookstore that you can use to buy um, best-selling books and also books for school. And you could save a couple of trees and uh, store it to all and synchronize it across all your Apple devices, which is really handy. Uh, you can actually buy a book on the iTunes store and everything you're logged into, an iPhone, a Mac computer, or an iPad, you can synchronize them all and have that book so you can just move from one device to another. So that's pretty cool. Uh, very, very big selection of ebooks out there and uh, more and more being added every day, including some of mine, but we'll talk about those later. Um, <laughs> It ships, the iPad ships with the Safari browser. They recommend you use that. And um, what a lot of people get in trouble with here is uh, it's tabbed browsing. So once you open something or click on another link, you're going to see across the top that you'll have a million tabs open. And the more tabs you have open, the more memory it uses. The more memory you use, the slower your device gets. And the more confusing it gets, frankly. You may have a whole bunch of tabs there. You may have the same tab open. A lot of people aren't aware that there are tabs on there. They're like, well, what's all this? And um, you can click throughout those tabs and close the ones you don't want to use and just bounce back and forth. It's really an easy way to, to pop back and forth. If you're looking up two things at once, like you're, say you're car shopping, you could have the car dealer open on one page and then the reviews on another page and just bounce back and forth between those tabs. So you can surf the web. You can do um, all popular email applications, including Google, AOL, and Yahoo and everything, just like a regular old browser. Just about everything is compatible with the latest version of Safari. So that's pretty cool. The only thing you won't be able to do on any iPad or any Apple device, for that matter, uh, any portable devices, uh, do anything with has games. Like some of the old crossword puzzles and some of the old uh, games were made with Flash. And Flash has essentially gone away. And Apple said, no way, we're not letting you put Flash on our stuff for one reason or another. Nobody really knows why. So, um Good news, if you're used to Chrome or Firefox on a PC or a Mac, you can put that on your iPad, too, and it works just as well. And you can sync your browsers and your bookmarks and your passwords and all that stuff across all of your devices. So that's pretty cool. So Chrome and Firefox work very, very well on an iPad. Now, email is a different animal. If you have a POP email or a traditional email, like a Bright House email or an AT&T email, or uh, one of them that your Internet service provider gives you, uh, most of the POPs you can set up fairly easily on the iPad and retrieve all your email. It also works very well with IMAP email, so you can synchronize across devices, meaning if you delete it in one place, it'll delete it in all of them. Um, and also, it is uh, very friendly with attachments. You can view Word and PowerPoint and Acrobat files just like you would on any PC. So that's pretty cool. It's a pretty feature-packed uh, email 
uh, 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 application. You can create folders and uh, arrange things the way you want to. So it's actually a really good way to check email. A little more virus resistant than the um, PC applications. So that's a good thing to use if you have a traditional POP. Now, if you have uh, Gmail, now Gmail is a little finicky depending on which iPad you have, which version of the operating system you're using, whether it's Tuesday, if you had pickles for lunch. There's all kinds of strange things that happen with Gmail. And what we recommend and what Google recommends is actually using, downloading and using the Gmail application on your iPad to check your Gmail if you're using Gmail. You save yourself a bunch of headaches and uh, it'll work a little bit better that way. Of course, you can use the Safari browser, also Google Chrome and um, Mozilla's Firefox browser to check your email that way, just like a typical web browser, if that's the way you're accustomed to doing it. So um, Gmail use the gmail app save yourself some headaches it will work but it takes a little bit of customization and uh, you may have to set change some settings which are very very deeply buried in the gmail application um, on the gmail well within gmail themselves to allow less secure applications to access your stuff and then you need some kind of special password and the gmail app avoids all that stuff and it just natively works with gmail so use the gmail app and save yourself some headaches now, iTunes is uh, where this thing all started. iTunes is built into every Apple device, and uh, you can purchase songs. That's how it started with music, but now music, audiobooks, TV shows, podcasts, and already all kinds of stuff there. Um, uh, here's the thing, too. You can, as you could with a computer, you can put your CD collection. You can move your entire CD collection and dig digitize it through iTunes. But to move it to your iPad, you're going to need to connect it to a computer or synchronize with the cloud application. Again, that's more of an advanced thing, but uh, just so you know, if you own CDs, there's really no way to get them into your iTunes library without a computer at some point. So I uh, don't know if there ever will be, but who knows? It's all uh, a big magic trick over there at Apple's headquarters. Now, uh, as I said on the bottom here, it's easier to buy it, which I... Unfortunately, I used to be a DJ too, and I've had thousands of CDs. And rather than take the time, pop them in my computer, take and wait for them to digitize and then transfer them over to my iDevices, man, I just go to the store and buy it if I want it bad enough. It's just time is money. You know what I mean? If it may take like 20 minutes or an hour to transfer some crap over to iTunes, I just, man, I just buy it. But that's up to you. Now, let's talk about what I can do, things that you can do with an iPad. You can surf the web very easily, very, very well. You can check your email. That works perfectly. Uh, again, if you're using Gmail, use the Gmail app, and it's flawless. You can watch movies or videos. If you're traveling, if you've got kids in the backseat of the car, it's great. It's lightweight. It's easy to carry. It's portable. The battery has terrific battery life. You can get up to, I've heard, up to nine hours on a charge, depending on how you use it. You can use it as a communications device with FaceTime or Skype, like one of those Jetsons video walls. Well, a small Jetson video wall, anyway. And you can talk to your family, friends, neighbors, or enemies on FaceTime or Skype. Both of them work. You can play a whole bunch of games until your eyeballs fall out. And like this young lady in the picture is doing, you can take pictures or video with an iPad. Well, you have to admit, anytime you've ever seen anybody take pictures or video of you, like in a wedding or something, you see somebody up there with this giant iPad device. It's really awkward. First of all, it's hard to hold up in the air for a long time because it is a little bigger and it's going to shake a little bit and it's just kind of in everybody's face and it blocks. So you really don't want to take pictures or video. You want to use your phone or a, a traditional camera. iPhones are much better for taking pictures and videos with them. Here's I can't do, which you really can't do. Well, you actually can do all of these things with your iPad, but it's a little more difficult. It's kind of the pain in the butt. Now, printing from an iPad, as you see in this picture, originally with the original iPad, if you wanted to print, you had to either email it to yourself, take a screenshot and email it to yourself, or put it on a photocopier, which a lot of people, surprising amount of people used to do with the iPad. But fortunately, now they have ePrint. So if you have a modern printer with a wireless connection uh, and it has the ePrint designation on it, you can print. Uh, and in most cases, it looks pretty good. In some cases, the pictures print a little squirrely and some of the pages if you're trying to print like traditional web stuff or pdfs sometimes it's a little weird but uh you can actually print but it's not real easy 
Um, typing, as we talked about before, it's a, not a tactile keyboard. It's an on-screen touch keyboard. You won't be able to type as fast or as much before your wrists get all kind of wonky. So if you have to do a lot of typing, you might want to look for another solution. And here's the big problem. You can't, as with all portable digital electronic solid-state devices, it's still very, very expensive to get solid-state storage. So these things match out, as we've seen before, at 128 gigabytes. And the average computer now sells with a 2 terabyte drive, almost 20 times as much. So you can't really store that much on your iPad. Now, the other problem with that is you can't get stuff from your cameras into the iPad because it doesn't have an SD slot. There's no slots. There's no USB connectivity. There's no way to get anything to an iPad easily unless you do it through a cloud or through a Dropbox or through the Internet or email or some kind of other awkward process. And that's one of the uh, one of the downsides of the iPad. I thought they would have fixed that by now, but no one listens to me. Uh, again, you can't connect to external devices. Forget about connecting a camera to this thing, although there are third-party solutions that you can buy these goofy adapters for and download apps but they sure as heck don't make it easy you can't connect an external flash drive or an external hard drive and store anything on it which uh kind of defeats the purpose which is why you still kind of need a computer if you do any serious work and <laughs> i would say on the bottom you can't well not that you can't but you shouldn't take pictures and video because it's like we talked about before it's just weird don't take pictures and videos with your ipad what's the matter with you so uh if you need more information uh, check our website. We're coming up with a whole bunch of new training videos, which hopefully are a lot of fun and entertaining and most of all informative. So check our website. We also have individual configuration and personalized training services online or in, in our store or in your home. So talk with one of our trainers for pricing and details. And that is our introduction to iPads. My name is Chuck Fresh. I'm the PCGYN. Please like and subscribe. And if we missed anything, don't hesitate to put it in the comments below. And uh, we check back on these and we'll reply to you just as soon as we can. Again, Chuck Fresh, the PCGYN. This is Computer Care Clinic's tip of the day. In a world of confusing technology, one man aims to save you from the craziness. And that man is Chuck Fresh, the PCGYN. And this is Computer Care Clinic's collection of tips of the day. I just wanted to thank you for posting all the videos on Computer Care Clinic that you have posted over the past couple of months. It has made my transition to technology much easier than if I would have had to go it alone. So just a word of my thanks and appreciation for posting all that stuff out here on YouTube. I'm Casey Kasem, and you're listening to the Computer Care Clinic, the PCGYN. His name is Chuck Fresh, and he'll help you with your computer problems. So thanks for listening to Computer Care Clinic. This is a message for Chuck Grodens. I wanted to thank you for all the help that you've given me with knowledge in terms of running Windows and Microsoft Office. It's pretty tough for an 80-year-old person to uh, learn this from scratch, so it's been very helpful. Just wanted to thank you very, very much.